Welcome to this week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 90 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. I'm also a non-scientist member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. I'm a district activist leader for the National MS Society, and I chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. My wife, Jean, lived with Progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. I'm thrilled to be with you today. I see that people are continuing to join our webcast, so let's give them just a few more seconds and then we will get started. Thank you to all of you who are joining us on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live. The MS Society's Ask an MS Expert webcast is designed to connect you with the MS experts who are ready to answer your questions on the topics that impact people affected by MS every day. So as I chat with our expert today, please feel free to post your questions on Facebook and YouTube or type them into the question box if you're joining us on GoToWebinar. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can during the Q&A portion of today's program. Rehabilitation is an important component of comprehensive care for people living with multiple sclerosis. Because MS is both unpredictable and progressive, the rehabilitation team you work with should have a clear understanding of the range of symptoms that can occur and be responsive to how they can vary from one person to another. Today, we're talking with Dr. Lacey Bromley, an assistant professor in the physical therapy department at DeUville College and an adjunct faculty member in the physical therapy department at the University of Buffalo. Dr. Bromley received her doctorate in physical therapy in 2008, and in 2018, she received her PhD from the University of Buffalo with a focus on metabolism and nutrition in individuals with MS. Dr. Bromley is in private practice as a physical therapist at Susan Bennett Physical Therapy. She's a neurological certified specialist through the American Physical Therapy Association, and Dr. Bromley is certified as a multiple sclerosis specialist by the Consortium of Multiple Sclerosis Centers. Welcome and thank you for being with us today, Dr. Bromley. We know that MS is a complex disease that requires a comprehensive approach to achieve the very best patient outcomes. And rehabilitation is an important part of that comprehensive approach. I hope you'll get us started by defining what rehabilitation is, who the various members of a rehabilitation team are and what their roles are. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, first, I'd like to just thank the National MS Society for asking me to come on today and talk with um, people with MS about my favorite topic, which is MS rehab. Um, I usually talk all over the country to different persons, um, neurologists, other physical therapists, other OTs, um, but by far my favorite is speaking with patients and answering their questions and getting them excited about controlling their disease process through rehabilitation. Um, rehab in and of itself, the word is an all encompassing term really that's used to describe various um, um, strategies that we use in different settings to promote functional independence, reverse any decline that they might have, um, prevent further complications, and really our most important part is to improve quality of life. Um, and that's what the research has shown over and over again, that rehabilitation can improve quality of life above anything else. Um, rehabilitation really should be individualized um, and it should be tailored to that person's limitations. And the treatment part really consists of a lot of education, um, promotion of behavioral changes. Uh, we have specific functional tasks that we can do. We can certainly recommend assistive devices. And then really what we wanna do is have this ongoing assessment to track the impact of the rehab on persons with MS. So the other question that you asked me was who are the various professionals in the rehabilitation field? And the, um, 
the answer might be as surprising that it's so many of your team members that you think about in the medical part of your disease. Um, the most important person in this team of rehabilitations is you as the person with MS who's dealing with the symptoms that you're dealing with. Um, the more information that we get from you and the more you direct your care, the better we are at serving you and coming up with the right plan of care, really. Um, but other members are certainly your neurologist. Um, and I know you might say, oh, they're part of our rehab team too, but they provide um, an important referral uh, point. So you might come in and see them every six months or once a year, and they might notice something that maybe you didn't or that your family members didn't, and they can refer you to the appropriate source. Um, to that end, there's other medical doctors, physiatrists that specialize in rehab care, um, and then mid-levels, nurse practitioners, uh, physicians assistants, and nurses that also are part of this team of rehabilitation. And they provide not only the referrals, but if we as a, a rehab professional think that maybe you need some medication changes or some medications that come on board, um, we can dialogue with them uh, to get the medications that you may need that will help us through the rehabilitation process. There's certainly physical therapists, that's myself, we deal with a lot of mobility problems, um, and we can also come up with exercise programs that you would do in between rehabilitation episodes. Um, there's occupational therapists. I know you've probably heard of them. Uh, they do more of like independent uh, daily tasks. So maybe cooking at your stove or folding your laundry or taking a bath. They help problem solve and come up with um, assisted devices or adaptive equipment that might help you with that if needed. Um, they also do very well occupational therapists in fatigue management. They, they tend to have a lot of good training on how to reduce um, the amount of effort you're putting into daily tasks, which can really help reduce your fatigue in other things that you need to do in your, in your life. Um, speech language pathologists are huge. Um, sometimes you can get brainstem lesions. Uh, which affect the muscles of your face, your palate, and your throat. Um, and these can um, result in either decreased swallowing, um, aspiration, and we don't want aspiration pneumonia in any, in any tr um, situation. Um, also just speech difficulties and maybe holding a tone or um, being able to project your voice. Um, so they can help with that. Uh, neuropsychologists and mental health professionals can help with not only anxiety and depression, which can impact all the stuff that I've just mentioned, but also um, they can help with cognitive rehab. Um, OTs and speech pathologists can also help with cognitive rehab. So it just depends on who's in your area and what their specialty are, specialties are. Um, also, I don't wanna miss social workers. Social workers would be the ones, you know, a lot of people say neurologists are like the point guard of your care, but I really think that social workers are. They know resources within the community. They know your, um, I see you smiling, John. I think maybe you met a couple of social workers in your, in your past. Um, they know insurance coverages um, and they know what resources are out there, who specializes in what. So if you have a question, you just call up your social worker and they can really fast track you into what's needed. Um, I have a social worker that works here at the Jacobs Neurological Institute that I talk to. She's like on my speed dial. If there's any question that I have about any of my patients, she seems to know their entire background and where to refer them to. Um, lastly, I have two more parts of the team that you might not think about. One is a registered dietitian. Um, they specialize in prescription of some type of nutritional support. Um, most often I see that patients actually are under eating and they're, they're fatigued because they're under eating and then they're fatigued at the end of the day so then they don't eat because they're fatigued and they can't make their food. Um, so uh, RDs are good at looking at the calories in, the types of foods you're eating, maybe suggest meals that are a little easier to make or work with you in times of days where you can prepare meals better so that you're not so fatigued at the end of the day to eat. Um, they can also help with swallowing as well, so they can work closely with the speech pathologist to work um, different foods in that the speech pathologist might uh, suggest for you. And then I have vocational rehab therapists and driver's rehab, and those are two that maybe you don't think about. Um, vocational rehab helps you uh, if you need to get back to work, and maybe you need accommodations at work, 
or you need your workstation set up a little bit better, they can come into your job and look at the efficiency of you doing your job. And then driver's rehab, we used to have one on staff um, about 10 years ago, and I miss him terribly. Um, so if maybe you had an exacerbation and you can't put your foot up, so you're having some difficulty moving from the gas to the brake, which would be a big safety hazard, obviously, um, they can work with you in a safe environment and actually take you out into a car that um, they control the brake on so that just in case you get in an unsafe um, situation, they can stop the car. But also they can modify your vehicle if for some reason they don't think you're going to gain back the ability to move your foot from the gas to the brake. They might be able to put in hand um, controls that would help you regain your ind independence in that. So big, broad amount of people are under this rehabilitation um, that I think maybe people don't think about all these all these different um, resources that they have uh, within their grasp. Well, you just mentioned so many ways that a rehabilitation team can really help people with MS. How much of a difference can rehabilitation make? Well, I'm a little partial to that question. Um, all of these professionals that I just mentioned have an immense amount of research behind them. Um, we have trialed everything under the moon on people with MS because, to be honest, people with MS are the most giving people that I've, I've ever met. I actually um, digress here a little bit, but I, I started my pathway to physical therapy thinking that I was going to be um, doing sports PT. Just get me with the athletes. Well. The first experience I had with them, one guy stubbed his toe and I swore he thought the world was ending. You know, he just couldn't deal with it. He was crying all the time and he just complained about not being able to play. And then fast forward a couple of years, I worked with my first MS patient. My best friend from home was actually diagnosed with MS around the same time. So I wanted to get kind of some knowledge, some background knowledge. So I started working with MS patients and I just fell in love with the, 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 um, perseverance that people have. Um, so fast forward a couple more years doing research with them, there is so much willingness to jump in and try new things that all of these rehabilitation protocols have been, you know, tested and proven, um, increased strength, increased cardiovascular fitness, um, improved balance, decreased falls, decreased fatigue, improved swallowing, um, improved por performance at work. I mean, you could go on and on and on about how much rehab helps people. And it also, to me, gives, gives people with MS a little bit more control over their bodies than they normally would have with just medication. Um, sometimes medication doesn't work or doesn't sit well with you. Um, and rehab gives you different tools that you can work on daily that give you a little bit of control back over your disease process. And the most important thing that's been proven over and over and over again is that rehab will improve your quality of life. And that's, and that's the biggest thing for me. Well, we're already starting to get questions and Jeffrey is asking, when should someone consider working with a rehabilitation professional? Lucy is writing that Let's see, she's been diagnosed for seven months, and Lucy's wondering if it's too early for her to consider an assessment for rehab services. So how does someone know when it's time to include rehabilitation in their MS care? Well, ideally, we would like to see people at time of diagnosis, and that's a PT um, speaking. Um, some of the other ones, some speech therapist, um, maybe a neuropsychologist, could be screened by the neurologist to see if they need that right at diagnosis. But ideally, PT, definitely OT, we'd like to get a baseline on you right away. So don't wait until you're already using an assistive device. Don't wait until you start to trip and fall. Um, come in right at diagnosis. We get a baseline. We get you on an exercise program that you like and that is safe for you, um, that you can do um, more regularly and more routinely. And then you start this lifelong relationship with us. We always tell our patients with um, MS that come in, you know, this is a lifetime thing. I, I've been treating now since 2008, so 12 years. And I have people still that I treat now that I've treated when I got out of school in 2008. Um, and so you just keep continually coming back and we tweak exercises. 
Um, and, you know, we, we also are a good referral source as well. So if you come in and I think you're speaking a little bit different today or, um, you know, you mentioned to me that last night at dinner when you were talking with your wife, you started to choke slightly. Um, I can get on the phone quickly with a neurologist and say, I think they need a referral to speech therapy. So just getting that relationship right off the bat is really great. And then, of course, um, periodically we like to bring people in. So maybe we see them for two visits in the beginning, um, get a good exercise program, get a baseline of, of their function, and then maybe see them every six months just to kind of check in with them. Um, uh, then especially when they have any decline in function, um, just to readjust, readjust the exercise routine or even get them on a short-term rehab program. So I always I discern the difference between an exercise program and a rehab program. An exercise program should just be um, maintenance or, you know, trying to improve cardiovascular health or just keep your well-being. A rehab program is really specific functional activities that you've lost or declined in because of either exacerbation or progression of your disease in some way. Um, so really, I guess the the answer to your question is all the time you should see us. <laughs> Which brings me to a follow-up then. What tips can you give to someone who wants to discuss rehabilitation with their neurologist or MS specialist? So um, I think now in this day and age, um, neurologists are fairly open to referring you right away to a rehab specialist. But there are some different things that you could do. Um, there are some screening tools available online. I know for like um, walking, there's the multiple sclerosis walking scale 12. It's 12 questions. You can fill it out. Um, it's easy to download. And you can fill it out and bring it into your neurologist and say, these are the things that I'm having difficulty with. Um, do you think there's anything that you can do to help? And maybe the neurologist says, well, first, let's check an MRI see if there's any new lesions. But if not, or if they know that there's no new lesions, they can refer you right away. But just open dialogue is the biggest thing. It's so hard when you go into your neurologist and you just don't tell them that you're having any issues or you're embarrassed about your issues. Um, this is their job, this is our job. Um, we hear every symptom under the sun, um, so don't be embarrassed to tell them just little things that you notice. Again, you know, talking with your wife at the table and you choke on uh, your food that night. Mention something right away. Since you're a physical therapist, are there specific challenges that should trigger someone to get physical therapy? Uh, in in general, in physical therapy, we're looking again at more mobility. If you think mobility, you usually think walking. So any sub, sub, subtle changes in your balance, um, even if you go to the grocery store and you notice like head scanning to the right to look at Cheerios, you fall over, um, or you lose your balance in just the slightest way, ask for a referral at that point. Don't wait until it becomes something that's bigger. It's way easier to reverse something that's small than big. Um, if you notice increased fatigue at work, maybe you wanna ask for a referral to an occupational therapist to look at your efficiency during work. Um, and then even the smallest change in your cognition or the mention of your family member saying to you, you know, you're forgetting a little bit more than usual. Get a referral right then. It is just so much easier to address things right away than wait until everything's piled up and piled up. And then maybe you don't even have the time to go to like three or four different therapists. You know, as, as symptoms start to come on, get them addressed right away. So now let's assume that somebody has set up that first visit, that first appointment with physical therapist or other rehab professional. What should they expect from their first visit and, and maybe we can also talk a little bit about what they can expect from subsequent visits, how they might be able to measure progress, and how long will it take before someone starts seeing results from that rehab work? Yeah, everybody always wants to know how long until I get better, right? Um, well, number one, uh, when you go in on your initial visit, um, Usually rehabilitation professionals are, are really nice people. So don't be scared. Don't be scared to tell them things. 
we get a lot of background in medical management as well. So don't be scared to ask them about your medications and then we can always refer if we need to. So if, if you come up with a medication and you say, I just started taking this and I feel this way, well, then I call the neurologist and I report that to them. So you can really bring a whole bunch of different things to a, to a rehab professional and they can handle it. Um, but that first uh, meeting is a lot of talking, a lot of discussing your goals as the patient. What do you want to gain from PT or from OT or speech? Um, I could have a thousand goals under the sun for you, um, and that doesn't matter. You know, maybe I want you to return to work and you want to go on your bike and ride. So, really, uh, a lot of it is a history um, and discussion of where you want to see your rehab point. Remember, you're the center of the, the team. Um, likely, you'll go through a comprehensive uh, evaluation that usually on that first visit takes about an hour. Um, I know for PT, what we do is look at your walking, your movement on the bed, going up and down stairs. Then we look for specific impairments, weakness, um, spasticity or increased tone, um, balance dysfunction, sensory problems, coordination issues. So we're looking at through all of those because depending on what we find, that's where we want to treat. We don't want to just treat you with a standardized exercise protocol that's not going to get you much better. Um, every, uh, every rehab specialty will have different tests that they select. Um, but really, in the end, they're going to come up with a plan of care that's addressed to your limitations and then also um, that uh, a focus on getting you to your goals. So it's all about the patient, right? Um, subsequent, subsequent visits are a little shorter usually because we don't have to do so much talking. Although if you come in to me and you've had a new symptom show up, um, I'm going to ask you about it and ask you how long it's been going on, how severe is it? Because I want to know, are you having any type of relapse and can I call the neurologist right then? And, um, this has only happened to me once or twice in my whole 12 years of treating MS patients where somebody's come in with a pretty new symptom, but I was able to identify it as a, a relapse and call the neurologist right away. Instead of that patient waiting for another, oh, week or two um, to get really severe, so they were able to intervene quickly. Um, but other than that, it would be, you know, I put my plan of care together. We'd actually go home and do a lot of paperwork, um, come up with a plan of care, come up with a treatment plan. And then that first visit, you come in, that first visit after the initial eval, you come in and we execute that treatment program and, and modify it. We measure success usually with what we call standardized outcome measures. Um, they're mostly validated by the research um, to show change in uh, somebody with MS. So these are specific measures that have been validated in the MS population, not in just the general population. Um, so we try to get as many of those as we can before um, you leave that first day. So then usually every three to four weeks, we recheck them. So an example would be that everybody would know would be like the time 25 foot walk. How many times have you gone to your neurologist and you've done the time 25 foot walk? And that is because it is so validated in the MS population that we even know that a 20% change is really what we're looking for. So they know that that significance of that change. So either it gets better, and that's with PT hopefully, or it gets worse if you're starting to progress with your disease and that should trigger a referral to PT. Um, but we have a lot of them. We have a ton of toolbox um, outcome measures that we can use. And then of course we talk to you. Like, do you feel like you're getting any better? Um, do you feel like your, your, um, your uh, limitations are getting easier to manage? Um, is life, roles becoming a little easier, um, is your fatigue less at work, and so forth. So we want to really know about you um, and how you feel. Um, usually, I tell people within two to three weeks, you should really feel what I call like a neurological strength. And that is just that your brain starts to fire better um, as you do a functional task. So Example would be like a sit to stand. Um, you come in, you're having a really hard time pushing off from the chair to standing. Well, initially I might give you um, some leg strengthening exercises or just that task, but modify it a little bit. Maybe I put you on a raised surface and I have you continually do it at home repetitively. 
um, within two to three weeks, your brain actually wires and starts to fire more efficiently in that pattern. So right away, you start to feel a bit stronger. The actual changes in your muscle, like your muscle fibers, really take around four to six weeks. So we always reevaluate at about three weeks just to see how you're feeling. But then our plan of care usually goes out to two months. So when you come into a PT, they'll tell you, you know, come in one to two times a week for about eight weeks. And then we kind of know if we should push it out even further. If you're reaching all your goals and you want to go farther, then we do that. If you're not reaching your goals at that time, then we need to start start to consider either adding medications, uh, revising our plan of care, or trying some different assistive devices. So we really, it's it's always constantly changing um, to your needs. Jamie has reached out to ask what type of background or credentials a rehabilitation specialist should have to work with someone living with MS. So how can our viewers select a qualified professional who knows MS to work with them? Yeah, and you know, I've worked a long time with the Consortium of MS Centers and specifically the uh, International Organization of MS Therapists. And we get this question all the time. We actually travel around the country to teach rehab professionals how to treat people with MS. It's not that you have to be a rocket scientist. It's just that you have to have the time and you have to be invested in it. Um, but there are some specific things you can look for if you are newly diagnosed and you really want to get in with uh, uh, somebody that's really worked with uh, patients with MS in the past. Um, you can certainly look for a comprehensive MS center. These are centers that um, have um, all of the multidisciplinary care team within them. So they provide not only medical care and you would see your neurologist there, but they would be able to refer you to psychosocial report or uh, support or rehabilitation services as needed within the same building usually. Um, Jacobs Neurological Institute here in Buffalo is a little different. We call it the MS Center Without Walls because our PT practice is actually outside of the city where the city is just hard to park in. Um, and go to often. So we have five locations around the city that you can access, but the MS Center knows to refer you to us. So if you're in a city that has an MS Center, that would be the first place to start. If you're looking specifically for a PT and you don't live in a city, the, there's a specialty that you can get after you graduate with your physical therapy degree. It's called the Neural Certified Specialist. And these are, you have to have two years working with strictly neurological patients. It doesn't mean MS patients, it just means neurological, so spinal cord injury, Parkinson's, um, ALS, and MS. But if you get your neuro certified specialist, you're usually pretty good at problem solving neurological problems. So those certainly, if you see NCS after a PT's name, I would certainly uh, recommend seeing them over somebody that has something like an OCS, which is an orthopedic certified specialist. The Partners in Rehabilitation is um, a, a, um, a certificate that the National MS Society gives some peoples or organizations that they know provide care to, to people with MS. So if you see that somebody is a partner in rehabilitation through the National MS Society, you can also be pretty clear that they know how to treat people with MS. And then lastly, there's something, a certification that um, nurses, OTs, PTs, speech therapists can all get, and it's called an MC, MSCS, which is Multiple Sclerosis Certified Specialist. And that's a uh, test and a, a proof that you've treated MS patients through the consortium of MS centers, and you have to sit for a, an exam to get that credential as well. Um, if you go to the imsrt.org website, you can actually search the database for MSCSs. Um, if you go to the National MS Society, you can search for the partners in rehab. Um, I believe the consortium website, mscare.org, you can search for comprehensive MS centers. So you can, you can search online for these people that have these different degrees and, and specialties in the area. Jamie's also wondering whether rehab is normally covered by health insurance and what out-of-pocket costs might she expect? 
That's a loaded question. Um, yeah, in general, majority of rehab services are yes, covered. Are they covered enough? Not, not nearly as much as we think that they should be. Um, and unfortunately, it's not really uniform across the board. Myself, I can only treat in New York State, so I know New York State's laws, but every other state has different laws. Um, every insurance provider has to par with the different organizations. So one Blue Cross Blue Shield might be taken at one place and Univera might be taken at another. Um, then you get into, well, how many visits do they cover? And that's usually where they lack quite a bit. Um, uh, I've had um, like um, one plan cover 20 visits over the course of a year for any diagnosis. So you have MS, you come in, if you get seen twice a week for eight weeks, that's 16 visits off your 20 and you're done like February with your coverage, you have maybe two visits left. What if you break an ankle, you know, you know, just walking around or um, getting a car accident and need PT. So some of that is lacking. The best thing I say to patients to do is just look at your card, turn it over, call that little number on the back. It's a pain in the butt, but they'll tell you how much is covered and what, because also there's deductibles in place and then co-pays. So you want to be upfront right away knowing how much you can afford and then you can work with your rehab professional. If somebody comes into me and says, my co pays $40, I can't come twice a week. I can't pay $80. Well, then I either usually, usually then I know charge them on some visits, but other PT providers might not have that flexibility, but they might say, well, then let's do a baseline visit and we'll check you in two weeks, then we'll check you in two more weeks, and if you're doing okay then, then we'll go out for four weeks. So they can change it depending on your insurance coverage. Well, thank you, Dr. Bromley, for sharing some very helpful insights into the benefits of rehabilitation in MS and how to work with your physician and insurance company to access services. Before we continue our conversation, I wanna take just a quick moment to welcome those of you who have continued to join us on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live, please let us know what's on your mind. Post your comments and questions on Facebook and YouTube, or type them into the question box if you joined us on GoToWebinar. And please help us make sure that everyone knows about our Ask an MS Expert programs by sharing news about the webcast with your family and your friends. I also wanna take this opportunity to mention that with Labor Day quickly approaching, We'll be taking a break next Friday, and we'll resume our regular weekly programming on Friday, September 11th, so I hope you're planning on joining us then. Today, we're talking about rehabilitation in MS with Dr. Lacey Bromley, and one of the things that the COVID-19 pandemic has produced is an almost instantaneous rollout of telemedicine. So I think it might be helpful for us to discuss how telehealth is being used to deliver rehabilitation services and what people might expect from a virtual physical therapy appointment. So Dr. Bromley, what specific types of rehabilitation therapy can be delivered virtually? So speaking of out of the blue and just figuring this out as we go by the seat of our pants, um, in March, we had never gone virtual before. Um, we always prided ourselves in putting our hands on the patient and stretching them out and really working them through different exercises. Um, but with the COVID pandemic, it kind of became clear that we had to change what we were doing. Um, so we quickly learned how to deliver care virtually. And I think almost every rehabilitation profession has learned how to do this. I don't see any um, profession that wouldn't be able to at least talk on webinars or on Zoom or whatever it is that they choose to do, whatever platform, and effectively provide some education and some easy exercises or um, interventions that the patient can do at home. Um, so I don't think there's a restriction on any rehabilitation members uh, to provide virtual care. How are you seeing virtual rehab sessions benefiting people living with MS? So um, before the pandemic hit, obviously with the pandemic, it's been allowing us to continue to see patients, especially those acutely um, diagnosed or 
that have had some kind of decline that really couldn't stop therapy. And I must preface this by saying PT and most rehab rehab professionals were considered essential healthcare workers. So we could see patients. It's just managing the risks versus the rewards. And a lot of times we saw that we could deliver things virtually um, and still be beneficial while keeping the patient home and safe. A lot of the drugs that people with MS are on are immunosuppressant, and we didn't know how that would work with the virus. So it was better to just keep them home. But also we found you know, it's easier to reach people rurally um, that aren't near these MS centers and don't have access to an NCS or an MSCS. Um, we can you know, call them up on our, our um, platform and perform a, at least a screen, and maybe they come in once. We um, started using a hybrid model where um, if we thought they needed an evaluation in clinic, but then their follow-ups could be virtually, then we would do it that way. We also were seeing that it was reducing the cost to the patient to come to PT. Um, we can schedule better hours around their work, per se, that we couldn't do before. You know, If you wanted to come in and see a PT, sometimes it's nine to five, and you have to get out of work to do that. Also transportation, it's been a huge deal for a lot of our patients that are non-ambulatory getting transportation to the clinic. And we've kind of like bypassed that and we're still able to provide some good exercises for them at home, especially if they have a caregiver that's there with them. And then lastly, something that I didn't even think about was that we reduced patients fatigue. They didn't have to travel to the clinic, they didn't have to park, walk in, you know, sit in the waiting room, do the exercise, then have enough energy to walk back out to their car and drive home and then cook dinner, say. So now we're able to see them with less um, less um, um, movement on their part, if you will. Well, I'd like to spend a minute or two drilling down to what that virtual physical therapy appointment might look like. What is a virtual physical therapy assessment and treatment visit? What's it all about? So the very first time I actually did a, um, a virtual visit, I had a doctor's appointment and I was like, what is this gonna be like? Um, and it's not that dissimilar to being face-to-face -face with somebody. So what we do is we use a company that actually is free to us to use as long as we stick below a certain amount of visits. But you can get a, a platform that's all the bells and whistles. Um, there's a waiting room. So beforehand, you get a link that comes in your email, and you click on that link, and you are set up into a waiting room. Sometimes you have to log in. Sometimes you just provide your name. Just even the first name is fine. Um, and then you're in a waiting room and that dings us and it says, you know, so-and-so is in the waiting room waiting for you. We let you enter and we see you very similar to how I'm seeing you today, John, is just face-to-face -face like this. We try to ask the patient to sit back a little bit so that we can see their movements a little bit more than just their facial expressions and hand movements. And then if possible, they have a caregiver with them that can actually hold a phone if they have an app on their phone or the computer a little bit farther away. So if we're asking for range of motion, we can see it. But a lot of times it comes down to becoming a very good communicator. And it's one of the first things you're taught when you go into any type of medical profession is history, 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 speaking with the patient, making eye contact, really understanding what they think their problems are, um, is it's become more important in this day and age with the the YouTube and um, all of the all of the uh, technology that we have now, because body cues are diminished. I mean, I'm sitting here super animated, and if you saw me doing a lecture, I'm like walking all over the room. So it's hard for me to just sit here and express my passion for MS in in just my face, but it's it's learning to do that face to face with a patient and understanding uh, their cues as they talk through their symptoms. But then we can do some objective measures. Like I said, if they had a caregiver that could set the phone farther away, we could do some active range of motion of their arms, look at their strength a little bit. Uh, we can do eye movements through the computer. That's very helpful in diagnosing different neurological conditions. Um, we can even ask them, again, if they have a caregiver, if it's safe to bring the computer or phone into their bedroom to show us like how they transfer onto their bed. 
maybe how they transfer onto the toilet or stand at the uh, sink to brush their teeth. So we can see some things that we can really help um, uh, give suggestions, education, and exercises to do. A lot of times what we'll do is we have home exercise programs that are part of a um, program that we can then email uh, the pictures to. So we might even do that before the therapy session starts so that the patient can review, review them. Because the biggest limitation with this type of communication is that you basically get 30 minutes and then the next patient comes in the waiting room and we can't jump between patients like we can in the clinic. In the clinic, we might have two patients at once. You see one for 30 minutes, the next one comes in, but the other one stays in, the, in doing some of the exercises and then we jump back and forth. In a virtual visit, you basically get 30 minutes and then you need to go to the next one um, and you kind of have to cut the other one off. So, so we do the home exercise programs a little bit ahead of time, ask them to go through them while we're standing there, you know, watching them to make sure they're safe with it and then if they have any questions and then we progress them as we see that they get better. Is there any special equipment or technology required for a successful virtual rehab session? Um, nowadays, uh, most every platform is uh, works with telehealth, um, Android, iPhone, Macs, Windows. They all seem to be pretty compatible. The exception is Chromebooks, which is a, a cheaper computer. And actually, I run into this with the University of Buffalo with students. Um, some of our lockdown browsers that allow us to proctor exams don't work with Chromebooks either. So that would be the only one that I've come across that doesn't seem to work um, uh, with a lot of different platforms. But yeah, um, Android phones, iPhones, um, Macs, and Windows, you can basically download the app for whatever um, telehealth program the uh, clinic is using and go from there. And how long is a virtual session? Um, so Usually it's going to be 30 minutes. Now the first visit we can always make 60 minutes just to kind of get the the background of the patient. But a lot of times what we can do is call the patient ahead of time and do more of a verbal, you know, background. Make sure that they're um, appropriate for a virtual visit. So people that wouldn't be appropriate would be severely um, imbalanced patients that just you know, we should have somebody spotting them if they don't have a caregiver, or if you've just had an orthopedic surgery. There's just not a good way to treat you virtually if you just had a shoulder repair or total knee replacement. Um, those patients would have to be in. So a lot of times we'll call the patient ahead of time, learn a little bit about them, make sure that their um, computer works with the system, have them even log in ahead of time, um, to make sure that everything, all the bells and whistles are working, that they're comfortable with the system. Because the last thing we want people to do is be anxious about the technology before they get on, because they're already anxious about coming to see us maybe. So we want to put that to ease. So we've actually been doing a 15 minute no charge visit, and that might be a little overkill, but we'll do like a 15 minute, come on to the virtual thing, say hi to me. Um, you know, is your computer working? Um, do we have a good setup at your house? Okay, see it, you know, in two days at your virtual visit. So we try to do that as well. Well, the technology check-in aside, how should someone best prepare to make the most out of their virtual rehab appointment? Um, I think the best thing to do is uh, to have the setup correct, um, a nice sturdy chair that you're sitting in so that you can speak with the provider um, and then if they need you to move, that you're in a nice sturdy environment, not, you know, on the couch with your laptop in front of you. It's just hard to move around that, that way. Um, if you have any questions that you have ahead of time, maybe even emailing them to the provider or calling, just so that when you come in from that waiting room, um, you get that 30 minutes and it's all about, you know, reviewing those exercises that you need to do and then progressing them appropriately and then talking and education um, and not a lot of um, other technical stuff or other um, questions that are just more, you know, just wasteful of the time. Um, we can always do those ahead of time. 
And how can you tell if your patients are making progress through a virtual visit? Um, so outcome measures are harder to do, um, physical outcome measures, although we have been doing what we call the five times sit to stand, where I'll actually watch a patient, I would have you do that, John, where you just stand up, sit down five times, and I have a timer on my end, and I'm timing you. So that one we found is pretty helpful. Um, we can actually have you mark off a 10 foot line and I would watch you stand up, walk to the line, turn around, sit back down. That's called the timed up and go. So we can do those. Um, but here we're relying more on subjective measures. Um, and there are subjective outcome measures that we can give the patients and then reevaluate them every four weeks. But then also feedback from the patient. And like I said in the beginning of the virtual visit questions, um, it's it's kind of a test in communication and how good are we at getting things out of patients and what are they having a hard time working on and, and um, how do they feel that they're progressing? Well, if I can rephrase Jamie's previous question, are virtual physical therapy visits covered by insurance? Yes. So that one's an easier answer because of COVID. <laughs> they basically cover everything now. Um, so back in March when it first happened, pretty much nobody was covering rehab telehealth. Um, and then very quickly they jumped on the bandwagon and now um, we haven't found an insurance company that is not covered. Great, well, Dr. Bromley, you've shared lots of really helpful information today. What would you say are the top three takeaways that our audience should keep in mind? I think number one, that rehabilitation professionals are part of your team. You, you are in control. Get a baseline visit from as many professionals as you think you need around you so you can establish that relationship really early. Um, you should feel comfortable enough with them that you can call them, not your neurologist, every single time if you have any concerns with your disease process. So instead of every time calling your neurologist when you feel like your balance is off, then maybe you, you contact your PT. And it's just a little bit more efficient for you and a little less stress for you. Um, I would say the other thing is just try to live in an overall healthy wellness-based lifestyle. You don't have to go on an extreme diet. You don't have to do anything crazy with supplements. It's just get enough sleep, reduce your stress, try to add things in that are good for you to eat, not take things away that you think you love. Um, and just try to practice that mindfulness of, of day to day life. That's, that's what I try to preach at PT. Um, it doesn't matter if you do all your exercises and you eat the perfect thing. If your stress levels are through the roof, you're just, it's just counterproductive. And then lastly, believe that you have control. And that's really what we try to teach in our PT practice is that you as the patient have a lot of control over your symptoms and you have these people around you to support you to do that. And the rehabilitation team are part of that. Um, and, and speak your story. You know, If you feel like you're having a hard time mentally, if you feel like you're having a hard time cognitively, physically, tell somebody right away. Hi, Dr. Bromley. I think we might have lost John there for a moment. Thank you. He seems a little still. Well, he was just getting to the portion of our program where we were going to turn things over to some live questions from our audience. And so I'll just go ahead and start reading those to you. We heard from um, a lot of people before the program even started. Um, Veronica and Betty are both asking about how to strengthen the muscles in their legs. Um, so I know you don't know both of them um, personally, and so you can't speak specifically, but are there some general things that people who have weakness, especially given that some of these folks are telling us, I can't do the exercises that I once did because of COVID, are there things people could be doing at home that could help them strengthen some of their muscles? Yeah, I think in general, and you're right, it's hard when you don't see patients to actually prescribe them the, the exercises that they need. But we actually push core strengthening a lot more than lower extremity. And I, I want to explain that core actually means your hips and your upper legs, as well as your abdomen, which everybody thinks uh, core strengthening gets you a six pack. But really, core strengthening gives you stability. 
So then you're allowed to use the muscles in your legs a little bit simpler. So core exercises are a lot simpler and a lot safer to do at home um, than some crazy squats that you might want to do uh, for your lower extremities. But um, being on your hands and knees and kicking your leg out backwards, we call that a, a bird dog type exercise. Um, going from your hands and knees up onto your knees. So like a movement that kind of actually teaches you how to stand up safely. And then I always love just doing functional tasks, repetitive sit to stand, repetitive step ups. So not stairs once a day, repetitively doing like 20 steps up and down um, to strengthen the muscles in the legs. So a lot of things that I like it is, is more just functional. If you can't do it or you feel weak doing it, then you need to practice that with a little modification, maybe a little higher surface or a little lower surface if you're stepping up on it. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, we hear from people each week that are struggling to manage the various symptoms of MS. And this week we heard from um, Leilani, who's asking if physical therapy could help with pain. And, and similar to that, Lorraine wrote in asking about spasticity and says she uses medication to manage her stiffness, but is there anything else she could be doing? Um, Talk to us about what you help your patients who have pain or spasticity with. So a lot of times I actually find that pain is not coming from MS in and of itself, but secondary issues that are arising from impairments of MS. So if you're weak or you're spastic, um, or maybe your core is so weak that your low back is taking too much strain and that's causing pain, or that you're in poor posture because you're at work all day hunched over a computer, and so you have neck pain that's radi radiating down your arms. The only way to like really uh, identify if it's MS or if it's musculoskeletal is to go see a PT and they can do some tests and look at that. But um, to manage that really is good exercise routine, good posture, getting on a strengthening, a core strengthening program, stretching muscles that are tight. Um, and then, and only then, if you feel like this is, this is severe MS pain, do we add medications or ask for medications at that point? And usually it's something like the gabapentin that's a little bit more of a nerve pain or nerve blocker. Um, as far as spasticity goes, um, there's a lot of medications out there. So if you're on baclofen and, and it's not working, you can either increase the dose or add medication like tizanidine. But a lot of times those cause uh, a lot of severe fatigue and you're already fatigued from having MS and you're fatigued from all everybody's fatigued, even if they don't have MS nowadays. Um, so we try to promote a good exercise program to deal with spasticity as well. And in particular, repetitive motion. So um, I love cycling for this. So that repetitive stretching and flexion, uh, extension flexion of the leg actually reduces the tone within the spinal cord and the cortex. Um, and it allows your legs to relax. And then after that, you do a good stretching. Um, and then that helps you manage your symptoms a little better than just adding medication. Now, if it becomes really bad um, or you can't tolerate baclofen at all and you need it, you can look into what's called an ITB pump. It's an interthecal baclofen pump in which they put an actual pump into just under your belly fat and do a catheter into your low back. And we used to do trials as PTs with the neurosurgeon um, to make sure that it would help people. But it delivers a much, much smaller dose, like hundreds of tenths smaller than what you take orally. And you get none of the side effects. So you don't get that fatigue or um, lethargy from taking baclofen through the ITB pump because it goes directly where it's needed and it can be controlled a little bit more. So that would be something to ask the doctor if, if the spasticity became so unmanageable that you felt like it was interfering with your, your daily life. That's really helpful. Um, so we're hearing from some folks who have done physical therapy, but haven't necessarily gotten the great results they were hoping. So I wanted to ask you about that. So Paul says, after a limited exercise, he becomes very fatigued. Um, and he's wondering if it's really helpful to keep going with exercise or if he's really just causing more harm. Um, and we heard from someone else who was saying that, uh, it was Carrie, who was saying that just after walking even 10 minutes, her legs start to feel 
like they're tingling um, and going numb. She's wondering, should she push through or should she stop? So what kind of advice do you give to Paul and Carrie? So I'm, unfortunately, we are dealing with the disease process that's going on in the background, and we need to kind of modify depending on what that patient also wants to do through the day. Now, fatigue, I like to look at it multifactorial. I mean, you can have central fatigue, definitely, and that's just demyelination within the brain and the spinal cord that's causing these fatigue sim symptoms. But most often, it's a secondary cause of fatigue that really bothers people. Um, and so what I would say is, let's look at other factors first. Are you getting good nutrition? Number one, if you're not eating enough, you're gonna be fatigued. Or if you're eating you know, a muffin in the morning, this is my mother, she eats a muffin in the morning, and then she'll eat well, like a couple ch pieces of cheese at like 2 p.m. That is not enough energy to sustain you through the day. So let's, let's look at your nutrition. Let's look at your sleep patterns. Are you sleeping through the night? A lot of people do not get enough sleep and they just kind of write it off as, oh, I didn't, yeah, I got two hours of sleep last night. So if we can look at sleep, at medications that they may be on that's causing fatigue. Because I think exercise is important enough to, um, to prioritize it. But if you have to work nine to five and there's just no other way, um, we might need to work with you in figuring out a way that maybe you only do two minutes of exercise in the morning, you go to work and maybe you do five minutes after and you slowly build your way up. The last thing I want you to do, and this kind of goes to the second question, is push through. So you don't wanna ever go from an exercise to the point of just collapsing or go to the, you know, get on a bike and ride 10 minutes and at the end of the 10 minutes you feel like crap. We don't, we don't want that. If you feel like crap at 10 minutes, then maybe we only want you to do two minutes, take a rest and maybe do that three times. So by the end of the course, you get six minutes. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but over time you can really build up that endurance better. But number one is let's look at other causes of the fatigue. Let's prioritize exercise because we know exercise can definitely decrease fatigue and then work with you within your work schedule to try to figure out when's the best time to exercise. That's great. That's all very helpful advice. And unfortunately, despite having many more questions, that's all the time we have for today. So I just want to thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'm going to invite, if John is back with us, I'll invite him to join us. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and close out our program. Thank you so much, Dr. Bromley. Thank you. You guys have a good day. And thanks to all Julie, of you. Julie, oh, it's John. John. Great. I have to I have to apologize. My home got hit. Well, actually, my entire neighborhood got hit with a blackout. We lost all our power. Oh so, my goodness. All right. So I'm here with you on the phone, and we can close out if you like. Great. I'll let you have it. Thank you. Well, no problem. But that, and and before I share a few very useful resources, I just want to share one more reminder that we'll be taking a break next Friday for the Labor Day weekend. And we'll resume our regular weekly programming the following week on Friday, September 11th. You know, I think that one of the best things that anyone can do for themselves, especially during these uncertain times, is to make sure that the information that you're getting is credible and reliable. So we'd like to share some resources with you. And these are resources that you can count on to be current and credible. I want to remind you that if we were unable to get to your questions today, the National MS Society's MS Navigator team is your best partner in answering your questions and connecting you to the very best information and resources. You can contact an MS Navigator by phone, email, or through the MS Society's website. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're in the midst of an emotionally difficult time for so many people. And I want to make sure that you're aware that the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They offer free and confidential support for people in distress, as well as suicide prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones, and you can reach them by calling 1-800-273-TALK. For more information on Dr. Lacey Bromley, please visit BennettPhysicalTherapy.com. And every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, I continue the conversation that we start here. So I hope you'll take a few minutes and give Real Talk MS a listen. 
You'll find the Real Talk MS podcast at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And we're all witnessing that even during the pandemic, MS hasn't stopped. And neither does the National MS Society. This webcast is just one example of how the MS Society has created virtual programming on the fly so that no one has to face MS alone. They've also created virtual support groups and provided resources and information about COVID-19 so that people affected by MS can get answers to their questions and healthcare providers can deliver the very best care to their patients. And they never stop advancing the research that will find a cure. The National MS Society's COVID-19 Response Fund has been established to ensure that the society can meet the urgent and expanding needs of the MS community. And I'm asking you as you're able to support the MS Society's work by making a donation to the COVID-19 Response Fund. To donate, just text the word GIVE to 68686 and you'll get a link right to the MS Society's COVID-19 Response Fund webpage. I hope you'll contribute today. You can connect with the National MS Society on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And please make sure that you're on the Society's mailing list so you'll continue to receive the latest information on MS and updates on upcoming programs like this one. I'd like to thank Dr. Lacey Bromley for joining us today. And I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us for your great questions and your patience and understanding when all the lights went out here at home. Please remember that a recording of this webinar is going to be available for your review at the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert. And now I have a quick favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webinar is important. So you'll see a survey pop up in a moment when we close out the webinar. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll see a link to that survey pinned to the comments section. And on YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continuously improve and it helps shape future programs. The survey takes one minute, so I hope you'll just take a minute and fill it out. On behalf of Dr. Lacey Bromley and the National MS Society, I want to thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices.